the three pillars of recovery is we've already touched on one nutrition the next is training intensity and the third and most important which i normally start with sleep sleep is the most important aspect of recovery now in terms of what i recommend in an ideal world we're all getting seven to nine hours of sleep opportunity per night not to be confused with actual sleep so sleep opportunity means you're in bed for seven to nine hours because if you're in bed for seven hours you're probably getting around six hours of sleep because we don't sleep all the way through so we need to account mm-hmm. for that so seven to nine hours of, of sleep opportunity per night is is ideal if you're in bed for nine hours you're probably getting about eight hours of sleep unless you sleep like a unicorn and you're, you're perfect uh, which I haven't come across them yet <laughs> the next that I mentioned is training intensity now I already alluded to it in the beginning but when I first started training jiu-jitsu I was on the mats like 10 plus times per week doing 10 plus sessions rather before we dive into today's episode, please hit that subscribe button. Your support helps us grow and inspire more people on their journeys. Thank you. Hi, Kiran. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks for having me. So, Kiran, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name is Kieran Lefebvre. I'm a jiu-jitsu purple belt and I run the Kieran Lefebvre Jiu-Jitsu YouTube channel bit of a content creator and most importantly, a BJJ strength and conditioning performance coach. And Kieran, where are you based actually? Yeah, so I'm down here in Sydney, Australia. Probably tell by the accent. So I guess this is the question that is very unexpected, but can you tell us how did you actually start with Jiu-Jitsu? Yeah, so my Jiu-Jitsu journey is an interesting one. I wanted to get into Jiu-Jitsu in around 2017, I want to say, when I was actually serving in the Australian Navy, me and a couple of my uh, colleagues at the time, my friends, we we went into a Gracie Baja in Sydney and, and just did a trial class just to see what it was about. And we, I loved it so much after that trial class that I did a second trial class. And, <laughs> and for whatever reason, just didn't, I just didn't sign up. I think it was a little bit of a posting situation because being in the Navy, you know, I wasn't sure where I was going to end up and, and we were uh, still in training. So we we're being posted all around Australia to complete our training. And yeah, so for whatever reason, didn't, didn't join it, but it was always in the back of my mind for years after it that I, I still want to pursue jujitsu. It's something that I instantly resonated with, was hooked to. And then it wasn't until fast forward a, f- uh, a few years, a close friend of mine, Zach, He was listening to the Joe Rogan uh, podcast (laughs) and was telling me, hey, man, you got to you got to get into jujitsu, listen to Joe Rogan, all this stuff. So we got into that way, uh, you know, me a little bit after him. And he said to me, um, oh, man, I I booked in a trial at, you know, my local uh, jujitsu club because we lived a little bit away from each other. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I booked in a trial for next week. And I'm like, okay, I've got to one-up him. I booked in a trial for tomorrow. So I did another <laughs> trial. In, uh, luckily, I lived walking distance to a jiu-jitsu academy. You know, I'd always run past and, you know, poke my head in and see what's going on. And after I did that, that second trial class years later, um, <laughs> I was hooked. And it was like 10 plus times a week. I was there all the time. Just they couldn't get rid of me and uh, since then. So yeah. after I left the Navy... Yeah, I more or less pursued jiu-jitsu as a career. And was it more jiu-jitsu or grappling? Like a gi or no gi? So it was gi and no gi. Initially, when I started training jiu-jitsu, I had the idea. This was my plan, my grand scheme, Tom. It was get my blue belt and then transition into MMA. But I never oh. ended up doing that. Um, I don't know. I just, after, <laughs> after training for you know, a few months, I was like, nah, screw this. Like jujitsu is, is everything. Jujitsu is the way. Um, I I'm, prefer I'm glad no to game, hear that, that you but, stayed. That you stayed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, you know, I'll just get the basics and start with grappling and then, and then move on to um, the uh, MMA. But no, I, I stayed true, like pure jujitsu. So yeah. And do you uh, plan no in game. the future to still try or transition to MMA? Look, I think that uh, learning striking is important. It's on YouTube, actually, my first ever MMA sparring match. You may have seen it, maybe. Uh, (laughs) If you follow, 
Jordan teaches jiu-jitsu. So yeah, yeah. for for those that train jiu-jitsu, Jordan teaches jiu-jitsu, very popular YouTuber. Um, and yeah, so I went over to Canada to help produce his jiu-jitsu theory course. And nice. in that time, we, we filmed some content. And one of them was uh, sparring in MMA. And I'd never even put on MMA gloves on before. <laughs> and I'm sparring with Jordan for the first time. It was it was wild. He kicked my ass. I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, just ducking my head and swinging. And uh, he really looked after me. Don't worry. Like he he didn't beat me up too badly. But the the worst part about it is that video is recycled every time MMA is mentioned, like in his backstory, or someone's doing like a piece on him or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And and striking comes up. They always use the clip of him <laughs> smashing me. Like uh, he. We're going off on a tangent now, but he he recently was featured in a like self defense championship series on YouTube. Whoa! If you haven't seen that, it's um fantastic. It, it's uh, Australian based, but um, they yep. get guys from all around the world. And uh, yeah, they mentioned striking in that clip, and then they showed the clip of him like punching me in the head. So it's so funny. I make a cameo in all sorts of stuff, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's my only experience with MMA. I can imagine, not gonna lie, I haven't tried MMA yet, but I would end up the same way or maybe even worse than, than you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And actually, before we dive more into it, for the audience that isn't familiar with jiu-jitsu or grappling, can you introduce these two sports and what's the difference between these two? Well, I'd say that in terms of jiu-jitsu, it's referring to Brazilian jiu-jitsu, so ground-based sport, grappling-based sport uh, that encompasses no-gi and gi. However, when we're talking about grappling, or at least when I'm referring to grappling, it's more leaning toward the no-gi scene. So we're talking about you know no-gi grappling or submission grappling, so it's wrestling, it's catch wrestling, it's a little bit more encompassing. However, you could still consider, you could still refer to judo as a grappling sport as well. So mm -hmm. grappling is a more all-encompassing term to define the sport. Uh, whereas Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is specifically talking about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So uh, freestyle wrestling would be considered grappling or submission wrestling would be considered uh, grappling. But yeah, and Jiu-Jitsu is considered grappling. And that's in my vernacular anyway, how I sort of phrase it. Yeah. And we discussed these two sports at MMA, but have you got any experience with any other martial arts? No, no. So uh, Jiu-Jitsu was my first martial art. Um, and I mean, I've done a little bit of wrestling, like wrestling classes and, you know, I've been shown a couple of things by a judoka here and there, but it's all under the lens and through the, the looking glass, if you will, of jujitsu. Yeah. So then, uh, throughout your jujitsu career, when did you actually decide or what was the moment uh, when you decided that it's not a hobby anymore, but it's like your career? Man, it was pretty early on. I would say... Once I got my blue belt, a typical fashion, you know, uh, it's when a meme. the most people quit. Yeah, well, it's it's so funny. It's like either you quit at blue belt or you start a company around jujitsu. You know what I mean? I've, <laughs> I've seen so many blue belts, and this is not a rip of like you're in this boat, but I've seen so many blue belts start like a jujitsu apparel company as soon as they get their blue belt they they partner up with a friend in the gym and they you know one's a designer one's the marketer or whatever yeah, i've seen yeah, it yeah. literally i've seen it like four or five times in different gyms all around the world like just from like people i know it's you know all the power to them like i'm not disparaging anyone starting a business it's just funny but yeah to answer your question directly probably around like that blue belt level so pretty early on man i was like i was obsessed like you know you talk about getting at least in the jiu-jitsu world people talk about getting the bug or getting bitten by the jiu-jitsu bug basically it's you know it's very common that when someone starts jiu-jitsu they just get super obsessed and that's all they do but i mean i i got bitten really badly uh, I, I suppose you could say and it just never went away and yeah i just pivoted yeah it's great to hear and hope it will stay the enthusiasm yeah, sure. and passion <laughs> and actually i haven't asked you have you got preference uh, jiu-jitsu or nogi uh nogi yeah nogi definitely why why is that well, I, throughout like the, the whole time I've been training, I've gone back and forward between like, oh, you know, the gi, uh, jiu jitsu and no gi and, you know, but uh, at the moment, I think that the future or not even the future, the now, the present is the, the no gi wave. No mm. gi, I think is, there's more, 
I wouldn't say it's more technical. I just prefer the techniques in no gi. For example, uh, all the guard players out there would, you know, probably agree with this that guard in gi versus no gi is completely different. And that is because of leg locks. Yes, there are mm. leg locks in gi, but because you can't knee reap in gi, it just changes everything. And I, I, you know, I'm not a leg locker per se, but I'm a big fan of leg locking. I also say that stand up is completely different. It's literally a more judoka style, or you know, more or less like judoka style versus a wrestling style. So the stances are different. The techniques are obviously different, not having the gi grips. So I much prefer wrestling over uh, judo. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just, I just don't. I'm more athletic. And, you know, uh, that's part of my branding. That's part of like what I teach people is how to become more explosive, more powerful, more athletic. And you can really express those physical attributes to a much greater degree and to have more devastating effect uh, on the mats in Nogi because yep. it's less friction. It's easier to, to be more explosive and more or less people that aren't as physical as you can't slow you down with your, uh, with their gi grips. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great points, and I agree with you. And or I would say that no gi, I find it maybe more exciting to watch because with all those leg locks and leg attacks, yeah. I just find it impressive how how fast yeah. it is, how they roll and everything. I'm always like, oh my god, this is so scary. <laughs> For example, yeah, recently, for sure. I'm sure that that you watched when there was CJI and ADCC of at course. the same time. Of course, it was just you know like a yeah. holidays for us yeah it was wild i had like at one point i had four screens i had like my two <laughs> monitors all the, the split screens going and watching this one on mute watching that one and yeah 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 and how did you actually see cji because by craig jones who is originally from australia as well and for sure levi is from australia as well so how did you see it i loved cji i thought it was absolutely fantastic the standout performance for me for the entire CJR was definitely Levi Jones Leary. Um, mm. I'm biased as hell. I'm Australian. I've, <laughs> I've met Levi. I've rolled with Levi. I've oh, really? interviewed Levi. Yeah, yeah. So oh, wow. I, I know Levi, uh, not like super well, but I would say that I know him and I, you know, consider him a friend. So I'm, I'm biased. But mm-hmm. I think that Levi uh, definitely won, in my opinion, the, the finals. And, um, mm-hmm know beat Rotolo, but you know that's a, a debate for another day but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was fantastic from the over 80 kilo division to the under 80 kilo the, the marketing push behind it the, the spectacle the i loved the pit for and this is maybe go over the heads of people that haven't seen cj i don't know what we're talking about but the combat karate style pit that they use or the alley as they referred to it was absolutely fantastic we saw oh, some yeah, i agree interesting jujitsu from it absolute wild scrap between uh tackett and rotolo that was will go down in history as the greatest grappling match of all time and uh yeah so absolutely blown away by cgi don't get me wrong there was some awesome performances in adcc as well because you know we're always going to be comparing and contrasting Mm -hmm. (laughs) but i don't see it as a this or that i see it as you know cji and adcc but if i had to say you know which event performed the best by far cji uh, blew adcc out of the water I have to agree. And I think Craig Jones is marketing genius with everything Absolutely. he's done before. All the post- podcast appearances, his yeah. social media presence is just master. And I would recommend yeah. it. Actually, anyone who is not interested in judges or doesn't do that, mm. still try to watch it because just very engaging and a great watch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then I'd be curious, then throughout your uh, judges or Nogi career, were there any challenges or injuries or obstacles that you faced and if so how did you get through yeah so i i have had a few injuries uh, i've come off pretty light in comparison at for someone that has trained as much as i have and for as long you know you would expect something but i have been lucky no surgeries uh knock on wood but i have yeah, had a partial lcl yeah yeah i have had a uh, partial lcl tear last year which was not great. That was when I was living in Sweden um, and it was completely my own fault, just a freak, uh, you know, not even my own fault, just a freak accident. No, it wasn't even a submission. I was in guard and I was going for uh, what's called a choy bar. So it's a specific entry where you're framing away your opponent's head with your shin and your leg kind of circles around their shoulder and attacks and uh, belly down armbar. 
Yeah. And as I uh, went to rotate like a, a windscreen wiper, egg beater rotation of my leg, it just popped and the the partial tear was there. It was just happened. I still do choy bars. It's one of my favorite entries, but it hasn't disparaged <laughs> me and I still do it on the same leg that I popped. So, you know, it is what it is. I did the, I went to, you know, the surgeons got the MRIs and what did my own uh, did my own rehab and, and uh yeah it was you know a few few weeks or like six to eight weeks i think uh, off the mat unfortunately but... not something too serious no not too serious no. i mean i've rolled ankles i've sprained my ankles you know i've had issues with like fingers and you know um shoulders and just nickels here and elbows not tapping early as a white belt yeah so i've had those sort of niggles that which you know happens and... but uh, i think the lcl was the biggest one and what about some you know, sometimes you feel like more motivated. Sometimes you're less motivated. Did you feel this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like motivation comes and goes. There was a period of time where I was, luckily I was sponsored by my gym, uh, my coach who I also do a podcast or did a podcast with, uh, Adam Charles. He he sponsored me, you know, and we had a, an agreement that I would have to attend a minimum of six classes per week. And in return, I get you know, the free membership, uh, competition support, all that sort of stuff. And I represent the gym. Uh, so for the reason I bring this up is luckily, regardless of motivation, I had a obligation to show up because it was an agreement that I made. And that, that was my uh, end of the, the fulfilling the agreement we had. So regardless of whether I felt like training or not, I had to hit those six sessions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't have those, uh, well, not obviously, but I don't have that anymore. It's harder now to ensure that I get my minimum or my personal minimum standard of training in because there's no one there, you know, over yeah, my head, there's no one there checking me. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, motivation comes and goes for sure, for sure. But regardless, I think that if you take, if, you, if you're really into jujitsu and you take a week or even a two week period off and you don't start getting that like, oh, I want to get back on the mats then you know uh we're, we're just in a different boat so you, after two mm -hmm. weeks i'm like okay i'm like i really want to go train so yeah that's never yeah. a problem i agree because i just had a as we are recording now i had a week break and it was very helpful like to recover the mm -hmm. body uh, yeah. maybe to get motivated again and once i'm back i feel really excited so it's, it's yeah, great for sure. and you said a number of sessions per week so what is your uh, number number of sessions per week now or yeah so what you my... try to hit my personal minimum standard is three per week. Similarly, I prefer to be operating four to six for these days. When I first started jujitsu, I was like 12, 10, 12 a week plus. But that's oh not sustainable. Yeah, that's a would, lot. I, yeah. It's so many, so many. It's, uh, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable, mm -hmm. particularly if you are interested in reducing your risk of injury and, and lifting weights, which you should be if you're training jujitsu. So it's really not sustainable to be getting in your dedicated strength and conditioning work to, you know, improve your longevity on the mats and reduce your risk of injury on the mats and still, you know, perform on the mats. So you, it's, it's kind of like you can't have your cake and eat it too in that sense. But, you know, this problem is not many people have this specific problem. So for me at the moment, minimum three jujitsu per week, optimally, uh, or maximum, we could say six. And then for strength and conditioning, I'm lifting a minimum of two times per week. But most weeks, it's three. So minimum is two, but I, I hit three. So it's three and three or, you know, three and three and six. Yep. And in a gym, are you as a student or are you also a coach in a gym? I'm, I'm doing both. If you asked me this question um, about two months ago, I was pretty much exclusively coaching. Uh, so I was teaching, I think, three plus or four, four or five even uh, classes per week at one point. In, and I was doing a bunch of private lessons on top of that. So yeah both at the and moment is that, both. is that something you enjoy coaching or is it because you have to <laughs> no no i definitely enjoy coaching yeah i really enjoy coaching so from like a, a pure teaching and education or or coaching perspective i have a lot of experience being a personal trainer is a coach but also when i was in the navy for the final two years of my time in the navy i was an instructor and mm -hmm. during that period i was uh an a navigating officer and my role was to teach the junior officers uh, coming up and I taught them how to drive ships and navigate a ship essentially. Oh, there was, that sounds uh, yeah. impressive. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably cool that it uh, sounds cool <laughs> than it is. But uh, no, it actually is it was pretty fucking cool to be honest. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would, I would teach them, you know, navigation principles, pilotage, like uh, 
tight navigating in and out of harbors and that sort of thing in, mm-hmm. in the Navy. So through my years of experience in a, a teaching role in uh, young junior officers, I went through uh, instructors courses and, you know, uh, did a whole bunch of stuff and a lot of hands-on experience in high pressure situations. So in comparison, teaching jujitsu on the mats to a bunch of people that are super keen, motivated to be there and uh, pretty much frothing on the experience of training jujitsu. It's very natural, I'd say for, for me, luckily. But I find it really impressive and admirable when there is a coach that explains stuff well and it's engaging because, mm. of course, tried multiple different coaches and everyone is different. And also, although mm. I'm not a coach, I don't have experience, but I was trying to teach someone, you know, for example, someone less experienced. And that's when you appreciate when there is someone who knows how, how to explain it because it it may sound easy because I know the technique, I know how to explain it, but when it comes actually to the explanation, it's not that easy as it seems. So it's very yeah. admirable when there is someone who knows how to do that and in an engaging and I would say helpful way. So well done, I would say. <laughs> Thanks. And what's your preparation when it comes to the coaching? Do you do, let's say, a lot of research or do you know all the technique in your head already? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is a lot of different philosophies around coaching. I was very lucky, uh, or I am very lucky, I should say, that my coach, uh, Adam Childs, is a black belt under Fabio Gugel, who you don't know Fabio's lineage. Um, He is a very reputable black belt coach and the head of Alliance. So the two largest teams or jiu-jitsu organizations in the world are Gracie Baja and Alliance, both out of Brazil. And uh, yeah, so Adam's lineage comes directly from uh, Fabio, the first Australian black belt from Fabio. So, you know, Mm. not that I'm a traditionalist and I I think lineage doesn't really matter to be honest, but it's still, what I'm trying to paint the picture is his level of coaching is incredibly high. So I learned directly from him. I was also fortunate enough to, you know, be taken under under his wing, so to speak. I have literally hundreds and hundreds of hours podcasting with him on jujitsu topics. So learning from discussing topics with him and, and his coaching philosophy, that has helped a lot. On top of that, I've also done a instructor's course taught by Adam specifically for jujitsu instruction. So all of like my background experiences has helped significantly. In terms of preparation directly, I think for me, I do it a little bit differently from Adam. I've learned a lot from him, but I don't emulate him directly. In terms of uh, Adam's style of, of coaching and his philosophy is he will have a broad sense of what has been covered when, and he will teach different techniques from different areas. For example, one class, you may be doing a half guard pass. The next class, we may do uh, some stand up like a takedown, or uh, we may do guard retention tactics, or we may do, uh, I don't know, a submission from back control. So it's, it's changing things up because that's how he likes to operate because it keeps things fresh. But he knows in a general sense that he's covered all the key areas across all the three main classes, being the morning, the lunch, and the evening classes. Mm-hmm. However, my, my approach is a little bit different. I prefer to stay within a topic. I'm not saying that I like to do uh, the same thing over and over again, but I, I'll pick a topic for a series of, of weeks or, or days or whatever the schedule is. For example, I may choose half guard specifically, and I say, okay, so... We're going to start with half guard basics, then we're going to build upon it. We're going to look at different options, different sweeping options, submission options, et cetera, or wrestle up, whatever, whatever from, and it branches out as like a network from half guard. That way, whenever you're coming into the, if you come to my classes consistently, you'll build a repertoire from half guard. Or if you just drop in for one, you're at least going to learn something. You're not going to be completely lost. So that's how I like to do it. Another thing that I really like to do and I, I did this fairly recently, but um, yeah, I thought it was very effective. And that is after a major competition, we're just talking about CJI, for example, after a major competition, perhaps uh, a, a good example is ADCC trials, 2024, the, the second Oceana trials, specifically Oceana, watched all of it from start to finish. And during that, when I was watching, I was watching with intention of looking at trends. So specifically, I was looking at what was effective, what was working really well. But most mm-hmm. importantly, I was look, looking at where uh, people were getting 
uh, stuck or where people, what I deem to be the common areas of fault among the, the best competitors. And these guys, you know, would smash me. I'm not bagging on anyone. I'm simply, you know, uh, making notice of trends and then would uh, research the counter to what people were getting stuck with or, or what the common themes were and then teach that to my, to my students. That mm-hmm. way we can learn from the very, very best guys and try to level up jujitsu across the board because that's what these competitions are meant to do. The best, the best guys are meant to elevate the sport, but the onus is still on the coaches at the ground level, at the, in, the, in the trenches to ensure that knowledge is passed on. So mm-hmm. a very practical example of this is Levi Jones Leary had a absolute tear of a run through 2024 Oceana ADCC trials and his body triangle was incredibly effective. A fault of his, you know, is it a fault of his competitors or is Levi just really good? But either way, uh, people were getting mm-hmm. stuck in body triangles, right? Yep. So I, I went away and researched the best body triangle escapes. I implemented them in uh, sparring and then I taught uh, body triangle escapes uh, for about a week, the, all the different variations. And yep. that was incredibly eff- effective. Yeah, I love the approach. That sounds amazing. Because our coach, he does something similar that sometimes he teaches us something and he says that it's something that is trendy now, that it's popular, that it's what people use. And I really like this approach because yeah, nothing against traditional jiu-jitsu, but I like this because then, for example, when you go to the competition, you are not surprised. Or maybe you are actually yes. the one who can surprise other people. So I think yes. that's something maybe that should be adopted more or just my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. And you mentioned competitions before when talking about those promotions and sponsorship. So what is your experience with competitions? Are you an active competitor or did you compete before? At White and Blue Belt, I competed quite a lot, I think. I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know how many competitions, but it would be close to about 20. So not as not as uh, many as some, but like... Uh, than I was just about some. to say it's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's over a, a little bit of time, but I was competing. There was a period there that I was very active. I was competing every, not every weekend, but like at least once a month. And, and again, that was part of my um, uh, sponsor agreement with my yeah, gym. Yeah. <laughs> is competing i had to compete right so that was really good and yeah i learned a lot from competing absolutely i i definitely recommend i get this again from my coach and when i am in the position to be you know awarding uh, belts uh, i think that having at least one competition per belt is is the the minimum in my opinion yeah and i think that is something or at least from my experience something i would say challenging or something that everyone faces is the stress Mm. before the competition yes i assume that you experienced it as well at least in the beginning so how did you face it or how did you manage to overcome it to be honest tom and i haven't overcome it yet (laughs) i (laughs) i still get incredibly nervous um Mm -hmm. before competing never got to this well I, i did get to the stage where it was the the edge was taken off a little bit but i would still get nervous now, this is only for the first match. After the first match, the nerves go away. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't know about uh, your experience, but in my experience, after I have my first match of the day, more or less, I'm no longer nervous. Or the, it's nowhere near the same magnitude. Maybe like in, before the finals, I might get a little bit, you know, a little bit of butterflies and whatever, but I'm focused on the job. And mm-hmm. you get to the point where you just don't care anymore. Like there was one competition where I... I signed up for all four divisions. So Gi and no Gi, no weight and absolute. Was Unfortunately, in the same day. Yeah, yeah, in the same day, yeah. Whoa. Unfortunately, I, I missed the first one. So I missed my Gi weight. It was my poor planning plus expected traffic jam due to an accident. I was like 20 minutes late, I missed it. So I, I, I lost my first match by a walkover. But the next three divisions, I, I was really successful that day and I, I won all three. But it equated in something nice. like... Yeah, but the, yeah. the point is, it equated in something like ten matches in that day. So mm. after the first one, the the other nine, I wasn't, I was no longer nervous. I didn't care. Like it, it didn't matter. Particularly the last one, like the last few, I just wanted to go home. I was tired. I didn't give a shit. Like <laughs> so, I think the the moral of the story there is, if you remove yourself from the outcome and you focus on your input, you just say, hey, I I can't control the result of this match. I can only control my effort. 
or <laughs> what I'm doing in the match. That's that's all. That's all the variable I can control. So what's out of my control, just you know, don't worry about it. It's so mm-hmm. easy to say, very hard to do. I still haven't mastered <laughs> the art of um, you know, not being nervous before my first match of the day, though. No, I, but I, I think still it, can't it's do a, it. It's a great advice, and what maybe helped me was to think that other competitors are going through the same or it's yep. likely that most of them are going through the same of course if there's <laughs> someone who's been competing all the time it's probably different but it's yeah. just a natural thing are you looking to elevate your online presence check out trailblaze our digital marketing agency whether it's standing out on social media crafting a stunning new website or developing impactful visuals trailblaze has got your back Visit trailbase.digital and reach your online potential today. When it comes before the competition, do you have any specific habits or like routines before the competitions as a preparation? Mm. So I try not to change any of my routine. I keep things consistent. If I'm following a specific diet or a nutrition plan or what have you, I try and keep it all consistent throughout the days leading up to the competition and especially the day of. I don't change my routine in terms of introducing anything new. I don't supplement with like pre-workout or anything like that. If, if I take creatine, I'm taking it at the same time. So I keep things as consistent because your body is, you know, we just touched on it. You're under so much stress already, mental stress mm. and mental load. You don't want to be adding anything new. Now, in terms of preparation in, in you know, a fight camp, if I dare use that term, uh, borrowing from MMA, uh, preparation for a competition that's different. Like, yes, we will be uh, introducing different things like different cardio tactics, uh, lifting weights, training with intention and that sort of thing. But in terms of like the days leading up to the comp, the only thing I do is structure my comp day in my best performing day on the mats. And, and this is the advice I give to people. If, for example, Monday is your best training day in jiu-jitsu, say you have a break Saturday, Sunday, and your first day of the, the week that you train is Monday, and that's your best training day, then structure the comp so that it lands on a Monday, meaning that the two days before you take off. However, mm-hmm. like in the case of my coach, his best training day when he trains five days a week is Tuesday. So he'll train the day before the comp because his peak day, he just knows over years of experience, is the Tuesday. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't train the day before. I think it's mad, but it works really well for him. So that's the advice I would give in terms of like practical structuring your comp to make it your best training day of the week. Mm-hmm. That is smart. I haven't thought of it before. Mm. When it comes to after a competition, out of curiosity, have you got any, let's say, a specific habit such as cheat meal or something, how you reward yourself? <laughs> yeah, man, we'll go, we'll go hard. <laughs> uh, depends if I win or not. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, so after, after like it, yeah, it, man, it just it just varies. Sometimes like I come home and I have to cook dinner. Other times, you know, I come home, we we'll get pizza or whatever. It, it just really varies. I mean, I've, I've competed a few times, but um, yeah, n- not nothing super specific. I think uh, what's really important for me post-comp is to make sure that I show up on Monday to training regardless mm-hmm. of you know how i'm feeling whether i'm broken or you know so long as there's no injuries it's really important for me to uh, to show up to training on monday as a reset yeah. regardless win lose or or what have you back back to the routine mm. and then to transition to your business i would be curious as you said you started after you got a blue belt so what were like the first steps of starting a business that yeah that's a huge question so i've um run businesses before current business is bjj strong online which is uh basically training programs for jiu-jitsu in a nutshell for uh, performance injury reduction those are the main focuses but it's not my first business i've been an online personal trainer for uh a while since i think 2015 really coming up on 10 years yep. so my first business was uh, a different uh business and uh, specifically i'd work with you know weight loss clients and bodybuilding this was all while still in the navy then i ran a videography i started a videography company uh so this is ties into the content why i'm so into content is uh now, yeah. youtube makes complete sense to me <laughs> yes absolutely yes so i was a professional videographer and i started that with my friend zach who i mentioned uh the, the guy that got me mm-hmm. listening to joe rogan and yeah so we started a company called Ground Line Productions. It's still running to this day. It's uh, now Zach's company. I left the company uh, about a year ago to pursue BJJ Strong Online full-time. And then I started BJJ Strong Online at around that blue belt level. 
So I started yep. doing one-on-one coaching with people. I then did a joint course called the BJJ Performance and Longevity course with Jordan Pressinger from Jordan Teaches Jiu-Jitsu. So we, mm-hmm. uh, I co-produced uh, some courses with him. And then that evolved over time into what it is today being BJJ Strong Align in its current format. So to start a business though, to, <laughs> to answer your question, yeah, it really depends on what business you're starting. I've had some experience with a, a few different uh, business structures and partnerships, sole trading, company structure now, and yeah, uh, yeah. other you know partnerships, multiple partnerships rather. I yeah, meant, it really depends on what business. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I, I meant initially the BJJ Strong Online because I didn't know there was mm. a, such a background behind it, but it mm. makes a complete sense to me. It was like a evolution. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't go like I didn't get my blue belt and then just start you know, coaching people, personal yeah, training. Yeah. I've, I was a personal trainer for many years. Um, I had many, many years of coaching experience. Um, mm-hmm. I started jujitsu and I didn't do the, the typical white belt thing and, and start, you know, a pivot to coaching jujitsu people straight away. You know, I w- at least waited till blue belt. However, I did get a lot of uh, pushback from people, which is very interesting. And, you know, it, it is interesting that people would say I would get messages in my DMs. I don't, I don't get these anymore now that you know I've, I've progressed beyond, and like now I'm like there's enough separation between me and white belts. Uh, but I used to get messages in my DMs like, "Oh, I really like your content. I sent it to my friend, and he told me not to listen to you because you're a blue belt." And it, it like, and these these people are telling me not to like put me down, but th- these people are telling me like it, it put them down. They felt bad that yeah. they showed their friend. I'm like, what? Don't even worry about that. But um, yeah, there's a big difference between um you know, my, what my jujitsu level was and what my coaching level was. <laughs> but um, I, I do think it's important to have experience in jujitsu before you start coaching for jujitsu, even mm-hmm. though it's, they're, they're different. Yeah, that's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, because on your website, there are some quite impressive numbers. So mm-hmm. give people some perspective and uh, like a credit behind it. I would say yeah. there are more than 1,500 grapplers. Mm-hmm. More than 17,500 programs delivered. And mm-hmm. lastly, more than 2.6 million grapplers educated. It's, it's yes. really yeah. impressive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it goes back to the courses that I did with Jordan. But that's what in, I think we the course released in 2022 or 2021, somewhere around there. So, uh, you know, I've been in the jiu-jitsu specific space now for many years and it does add up pretty quick so yeah (laughs) and maybe to help to promote the course a bit you offer various different training programs but how does it work when someone chooses a program is it online with some teaching from you yeah really good question so i mean it's evolved so much over the years tom and like like I said, when I first started, it was only one-on-one staff. I was doing very personalized uh, coaching. But uh, I built out a library of what you would consider instructionals, right? So, so it's like BJJ th- Fanatics? Exactly. So what? And this is going to make sense once I circle around. Uh, now, the, the work that I did with Jordan, Jordan Teaches Jiu-Jitsu, we did a joint course in the beginning. And then I helped him with his Jiu-Jitsu Theory course. Now, the reason I'm bringing those up is we looked at the current model that was out there in the jiu-jitsu landscape of instructionals, like BJJ Fanatic style instructionals. And what we noticed is they're very long-winded, they're very boring, and the quality sucks. So we <laughs> focused in on those three elements and we made them succinct. They're not like short, they're, just, they're not eight hours long, repeating the same thing over and over again. They have yeah. very high quality editing, high uh, quality production, and obviously have high quality information so we took those elements and we produced what i consider one of the best instructionals out there i use the same sort of theory and what we developed and what i learned with jordan to produce courses on bjj strong online so that's on top of the training programs so the courses are things like uh, nutrition courses performance accelerated courses like teaching my philosophy about uh com- competing structuring your training for a competition all these uh, other variables are on top of the the main product which is training programs so they're all delivered on uh three different formats so this is not an infomercial but it's sounding like it <laughs> <laughs> um, like you can get it on pdf 
you can follow on the the website itself on the platform, the Be Digital Strong Online um, platform. You with your login, and probably the the best tool is a fitness app called Train Heroic. So depending on which one you like, like some people like to print them out, some people like to have it on their phone uh, with a PDF, and other people prefer the the fitness app. Everything's got you know videos and stuff. So yeah, that's that's how you follow the training programs. There's, yeah, a shitload of training programs. Is there a specific audience that you are targeting or, the, or it can be literally anyone? No, so gra- well, specifically grapplers. So uh, you're going to get the, the most benefit from if you're doing grappling specifically yeah. or combat sport. I do have people that um, don't do sp- grappling specifically. They train MMA, but it's still very applicable. So grapplers, 100%. Now, I have different programs suit different needs. So if you're focused on mobility and your movement efficiency, then you know we have a mobility focus, mobility and strength program. However, if you mm-hmm. want to get jacked and you want to build muscle, then you do the BGG Jack program. So yeah, we have different programs for uh, different requirements. And since you've worked with so many clients, with so many people, are there mm-hmm. any common recurring mistakes or themes that you see uh, across these people? Yes. Yeah. So the biggest mistake that I see grapplers in general make is particularly when you first start training jujitsu or start grappling, you will, if you're the type of person that recognizes the significance of strength and performance on the mats, then you will think, okay, I want to get strong. What do you do? You go online, you type in how to get strong for jujitsu, or you go up, like type in a powerlifting program, right? And then you download a powerlifting program. The problem with following a powerlifting specific program is it's not fit for purpose. Powerlifting programs will get you strong for powerlifting. They will not get you strong for grappling. It's a very common mistake that grapplers make is training like a strength athlete, a strength sport athlete. Strength sports are different sports. It's kind of like, Wanting to get sh- like good at jujitsu, so you go play soccer doesn't really make sense. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit of hyperbole. It's not quite like that, but you, you get my point. So that's the first mistake. The second mistake, and it's connected with the first, is people neglect the four. Well, some of the four most neglected areas for grapplers is core, grip, carry, rotation. Those four elements are very, very neglected in powerlifting and in bodybuilding programs because it doesn't really fit with the powerlifting model as such, and it doesn't really fit with bodybuilding because it's not bodybuilding's an aesthetic pursuit, a muscle building mm-hmm. aesthetic pursuit. It's not a performance pursuit. So yep. powerlifting, bodybuilding programs, and neglecting core grip carrying rotation are the most common mistakes grapplers make across the board. And are there some specific exercises that you would recommend to focus on? For core grip carrying rotation, yes, there is. If we just focus on the the grip and carry for a second, there's two main ways that I recommend people implement grip strength training into their programming. The first is through modifications. So adding things like towel grips to your uh, pull-ups or towel grips to your uh, bent over rows or dumbbell rows, things of that nature. The Mm -hmm. importance here is that grip shouldn't be your primary limiting factor in the exercise that you're modifying. So for example, you would never add, in my opinion, you'd never add towel grips or fat grip attachments, those large rubber attachments you can add to barbells to increase the grip diameter. You would never do that on a deadlift because grip is a limiting factor in many people's deadlifts. So much so that lifting straps are very popular for deadlift for that reason. But you would add it to something like a bent over row or a a dumbbell row, as I mentioned, because grip is generally speaking, not a limiting factor. So you can still work your lat muscles and your biceps in the row, but you're also modifying it to challenge your grip strength further. Mm -hmm. The second method of grip strength training is by adding dedicated grip strength exercises. Many, many exercises that work well for grapplers. But just to give you some, you can do a, a plate pinch hold or a dumbbell hold. And two of my favorites is the um, dumbbell uh, wrist extension and wrist curl. So those two are fantastic that you can add as well. And there's various other 
uh, grip strength specific exercises, different holds. For carry, we're talking about carrying capacity. So the farmer's carry is the king here. You can do various different modifications of farmer's carry. And yeah, so th that's for grip and carry. Mm -hmm. For core and rotation, core strength is so important, particularly for playing guard. But when someone first starts training jujitsu, one of the biggest complaints with guard is, oh my God, my abs are just <laughs> killing me. So, because you're in you're in a half crunch you're trying to maintain yeah, yeah. your knees to your chest your core is going to be on fire so mm -hmm. working that isometric core strength is really important there's various different uh symmetric holds you can do for core basic example is a hollow body hold if you don't know what that is just google it or look it up on, I, i'm pretty sure i have it on my youtube that's a fantastic example of core strength isometric now here's the kicker rotation out of all four is probably the most neglected a lot of grapplers mm -hmm. realize that grip strength is important so they add grip strength a lot of grapplers like feel the burn of their abs uh, in holding maintaining their guard feel that core is important but not many recognize the importance of rotation until they tear uh, some rib cartilage or get some rib mm -hmm. injuries yeah, because yeah. they're explosively trying to rotate and bridge out of uh, side control bottom or something along those lines so rotation is very, very important to train, and it's very neglected in power, uh, in uh, powerlifting and bodybuilding. Now, mm -hmm. what exercises can you do? Many, but <laughs> to give you some, to give you some uh, very basic examples that people would probably recognize, something like a uh, Russian twist, where you're holding, you don't even need to be holding weight, just twisting from side to side in a crunch is a great one. A, a version of an explosive rotational exercise is using medicine ball. So something mm -hmm. like an, a kneeling overhead rotational med ball slam. That's a mouthful. You're basically taking a medicine ball from in a kneeling position, taking a medicine ball from your left hip over your head, slamming it down to your right, and then taking it back the other side. Or you can do something like a single arm rotational cable row. You anchor a cable machine to the bottom, take it with a handle grip and you do a big rotation through your core. You can do this fairly explosively as well and uh, incorporate the, the row there. So there's many different uh, examples, hard to convey over a podcast format, but yeah. you get the idea. No, it's a lot of valuable content. I will need to do my homework as well and update <laughs> my workout because mm. I, I think I've been neglecting it a bit uh, and I, I think I should also update, update it. But another important part of this is obviously nu nutrition. So mm. again, can you name some recurring mistakes or just something that your clients yeah. fall short when it comes to nutrition? Yeah, so it's really fascinating. People fall usually into one of two camps and I'll, I'll go over the, probably the most common off the bat. And that is ironically, a lot of grapplers are under eating. They're not eating enough specifically the under eating carbohydrates mm -hmm. because jujitsu is such a physically demanding sport it burns a lot of calories it takes up a lot of your glycogen stores so you need to replenish your glycogen by eating more carbohydrate a lot of the time when people start training jujitsu maybe they've been training for a couple of months they're ramping up in in preparation for a competition all of a sudden, you'll start to feel really fatigued all the time. You'll be tired, particularly after lunch. You'll have that mid-afternoon crash. Your workouts Ooh. are getting more sluggish. Your performance on the mats, particularly if you do evening classes, by the time you get there, they're sluggish. Your sleeping is deteriorating. It's not because you're necessarily you're overtraining. It's because you're not fueling your body with the right nutrients, specifically carbohydrate, to repair your muscle restore your glycogen and recover from your training so that mm -hmm. puts you into a state of non-functioning overreaching for your training not because of your training stimulus as such but because of your shit nutrition so that is yep. one of the most common now to talk to the other most common mistake and this is less common than the first in, in my experience is a very specific individual, someone who has started training jujitsu as a means of uh, weight loss or fitness. And say they, they start training uh, jujitsu, white belt, whatever, they train for a few years, they, they get up to purple, they get up to brown belt, and they use jujitsu as fitness. 
But when they get older and when they achieve brown belt, they're starting to put on weight again. And they're slowly putting on weight, putting on weight. And they're like, I don't get it. I train jujitsu three times a week. I'm, you know, busting my ass, blah, 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 training all the time. And yet I'm still gaining weight. I've, I've gotten fat slowly over the time. And that's because as a brown belt, your movement efficiency compared to when you're a white belt is so yeah. greater that you're not burning as many calories. You're mm. not working as hard. You think you are, but you're not. So your nutrition, in this case, you're overeating. So you need to modify your nutrition and reduce your calories, I recommend uh, keeping your protein intake high and reducing carbs and fats in this case. Mm -hmm. But this individual is much less common. Yeah, yeah. And then the last one, also another important aspect, would be recovery. Can you name maybe some important aspects to focus on or, again, something that people shouldn't underestimate when it comes to recovery? Absolutely. Uh, Recovery is uh, one of my favorite topics because I think it's it's less sexy. Uh, it's, it's overlooked often. You know, people don't tend to seek out recovery information until, you know, they're hurting, which is fine. Until it's too late. Yes, <laughs> more or less, yes. So the way I like to look at recovery for grappling or combat sport in general, I look at recovery in three pillars. The three pillars of recovery is, we've already touched on one, nutrition. The next is training intensity. And the third and most important, which I normally start with, sleep. Sleep is the most important aspect of recovery. Now, in terms of what I recommend, in an ideal world, we're all getting seven to nine hours of sleep opportunity per night, not to be confused with actual sleep. So sleep opportunity means you're in bed for seven to nine hours. Because if if you're in bed for seven hours, you're probably getting around six hours of sleep because we don't sleep all the way through. So we need to account for that. So seven to nine hours of, of sleep opportunity per night is, is ideal. If you're in bed for nine hours, you're probably getting about eight hours of sleep unless you sleep like a unicorn and you're, you're perfect, um, <laughs> which I haven't come across them yet. The next that I mentioned is training intensity. Now, I already alluded to it in the beginning, but when I first started training jujitsu, I was on the mats like 10 plus times per week doing 10 plus sessions rather. And I was still trying to maintain my my uh, weightlifting and uh, my body was falling apart because my training intensity was far too high, especially when I tried to follow a powerlifting program to get strong for jujitsu. I made the mistake that I see many, many others making. Uh, so this is coming from firsthand experience. Yeah, yeah. Training intensity is reducing your training load but also adapting your training load with tools like auto-regulation, like RPE and uh, reps in reserve if you prefer, but basically modifying your training to account for your grappling. And that's where reducing your weightlifting to two to three targeted sessions per week will do a, will take you a long way. And we already touched on nutrition. So prioritizing high-quality sources of protein, carbohydrates, and fats but having around about 50% of your total calories coming from carbohydrates is what I recommend, particularly if your training load is high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds great. And just to be aware of time, what are your goals or aspirations or plans when it comes to either jiu-jitsu, your business, or even something else? Yeah, so goals with jiu-jitsu is longevity. It's uh, it's changed a lot. Like when I was first started training jiu-jitsu, I was like, oh, I want to be a world champion. I want to do this and that. My competition aspirations have uh, very much evaporated. I want to be, I'm, I'm now in it, uh, or my mindset rather has shifted for longevity. I want to stay as uh, active in the sport as possible, be as dangerous on the mats as possible. And for the longest time, particularly as I get older, still be able to hang with the young up and coming guys uh, that are coming mm-hmm. through so those are those are my goals now i'm not not that old but yeah just looking forward into the future right <laughs> so th- that's that's the goals with uh with my personal jujitsu now goals with bjj stronger line is make the product as good as possible just keep releasing new products um keep updating keep serving my my current client base um to to bring the absolute best product quality service as possible and uh let more people know about it that's the mm-hmm. mission and unfortunately we didn't have time to discuss it much but the plans with your youtube channel to keep growing 
Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I've been a lot more consistent lately, particularly when I uh, moved back from Sweden. We didn't talk about it, but I lived in Sweden for twelve months. Yeah, ever since I moved that back, it's uh, you know all systems go much. You know, now that I'm back in my studio, uh, better quality content and more consistent. Uh, have access to uh, an amazing gym. I have to give a shout out to Warrior Performance in Sydney. Uh, I train there for for weights. It's as it sounds, amazing. Warrior Performance, check it out if you're in South Sydney. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. So the YouTube channel, we have some bigger videos that I, I do have on the horizon, uh, probably coming next year, some bigger collabs and maybe going to Canada to visit someone, well, probably yeah. guess who. <laughs> Sounds exciting, yeah. Yeah, a few things on there. And I'm curious, why did you actually move to Sweden? Yeah, my wife is Swedish. So <laughs> we went uh, we and visited her family for 12 months. So she wanted to spend a little bit of time at home she's um you know been in australia for nearly 10 years but uh wanted to spend some time in uh in sweden with her family and i was happy to go so we went i still oh. trained jiu-jitsu when i was there it was a awesome uh jiu-jitsu academy uh not too was far it in from stockholm? where i was living. no we lived about two hours north of stockholm so in oh, a okay. rural part of sweden like in if you look at a map of sweden it's pretty much in the middle mm-hmm. in dalarna in the, yeah. the county and then just to finish it up now feel free to promote your services or where people can follow you, where people can find you. <laughs> Tom, you've been uh, light enough for me to knock down. I think I've promoted my services <laughs> plenty. But I will say, like, if, if you if you haven't heard me before and you, you're listening to this and you're like, okay, yep, I like what this guy has to say, obviously you can check out um, my social media channels, which I'm sure you're going to link to, or go to bjjjournaline.com. But uh, what I, I do recommend, if you just want to get your hands on a program, to improve your strength, improve your mobility, your performance on the mats, and most importantly, reduce your risk of injury, then I have a free program available, two day per week, 12 week program, uh, completely freely available. And yeah, that you can find that link in my link tree in my bio. So go to bjjstrongonline.com forward slash links, it'll come up. Um, or you could just find my socials and click the link. Mm-hmm. Or I, I can see it directly to put into the, the description. And as always, I will add any links to the show notes. I noticed you also have a newsletter. So any for any people that are interested in learning about Jiu-Jitsu and uh, strength and condition, subscribe to the newsletter. And Kiran, want to say a big thank you. As someone who's been following you and watching on YouTube, it was a pleasure to speak with you. I think we'll need to do part two at some point in the future because when it comes to speaking about Jiu-Jitsu, it's always a long conversation but we're excited yeah, for sure <laughs> and i wish you all the best stay healthy you know good progress on the mats and thank you very much for joining me likewise thanks so much Tom, for having me it was a good conversation appreciate your time thanks for listening to produced by with Tom. check out show notes for all the links and don't forget to like subscribe and leave your feedback speak soon